doing right now. Um, just to quickly to quickly structure this second trialogue, uh, I'd like to say that the the title is called the historical emergence of traditional archetypes. So, if anyone doesn't know what an archetype is, it's a psychoanalytic concept that was proposed by Carl Jung, or at least has become famously popularized by Carl Jung. And an archetype is a little different than a meme. So a, a meme might be a, a cultural unit of information, something that we, something that we might learn and pass on to each other, uh, an idea. And an archetype is a little more robust, and it's a little more um, trans-historical. And what that means is that archetypes are kind of like patterns of ideas and patterns of behaviors which have become so heavily utilized by human beings that they kind of become the unconscious structure of our, of our thinking. So in this trialogue, we're going to be talking about the idea that man and woman are types of trans-historical archetypes. And even though they might be something like trans-historical, we're still trying to, uh, to get at the core of um, their emergence, their historical emergence, and how they change over time, and how they how how we might relate to them in the 21st century. So, in order to start a dialogue about the historical emergence of archetypes like man and woman, I wanted to sort of like last um, episode open with a um, great old thinker, and uh, for this episode, I want to um, just quote William Shakespeare. Mm. So, with William Shakespeare, I, I just want to make the quote uh, where he, he said, um, All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And of course, he, he goes on, uh, and it's a much deeper um, quote about what it means to be a human and, and, and all of the different stages of life we go through. But what I wanted to emphasize in that to start a conversation with the two of you is two things. First, the world stage. Um, the world stage is something that we don't control. It's kind of something that exists as a background and we appear on it. And then the second thing I wanted to emphasize is um, the idea of a stage and actors is kind of um, signifying a drama that there's a, uh, there's, a, there's, there's a play going on and we're, we're playing with each other on a stage. And so with the idea of the historical emergence of, of traditional archetypes, what I want to get at is maybe why are those archetypes logical structures, not just for the world stage we find ourselves on, say the evolutionary background of the natural world or uh, human civilization and all of the struggles and constraints that um, uh, structure human civilization, um, but also the also the drama, the play. You know, like when we when we embody the archetype of a man or when we embody the archetype of a woman, we are playing a role. We are playing a character. Um, and why are those characters, or why are those types of characters? Um, why did they work? Um, what about them worked? What about them doesn't work anymore? Um, and what space do we have to play with these archetypes given our stage and the, and the way that the stage changes and given our, our drama, our lives and, and the way that the drama might be changing? So that's sort of like how I wanted to open the conversation. So I'll, I'll, I don't know how what you guys think of that so i'll throw that to you kevin first and, yeah. and see, see what you think yeah i'll jump in this, this is a brilliant quote Kadal, and i love that you picked that one one of my favorite quotes of all time actually because i think it it speaks to something very deep about the nature of reality and that seems mm -hmm. to be that especially in the terms of language and lived experience reality seems more like a narrative or a syntactical texture than it does mm -hmm. some you know, encounter with the unknown or encounter with reality. And th this stuff is really big and it's a bit hard to language, but uh, the notion of reality as a drama mm. really resonates with me. And I think it really resonates, especially 
and the sexual drama and the and the drama between man and woman the drama of not only reproduction because i mean that's pretty obvious like in my head when you were speaking it's like well the obvious reason for man and woman is like sexual reproduction um but sexual reproduction actually emerged later on the planet right like a lot of creatures didn't have a mate pre sexually pre the evolution of sexual reproduction so it doesn't have to be that way asexual reproduction is possible and i think that's an important point to just speak to for now but what was what was also coming up for me was the way in which man and woman as archetypal players on the stage of life you know we feel as though we are so unique and so new on the scene and we are we are a unique expression of the dna blueprint and our life experience and as a man i am living out the role of a man that has been lived out billions upon billions of times directly in my family line right all the men that stand behind me all the ancestors that are in my line but also on the meta level i i'm living the current version from my dna of all men that have ever lived as long as homo sapiens has been a species so i think that's a i mean i'm getting spirit bumps even thinking and feeling it it's like it's it's a it's a very grandiose and i i think a beautiful way to understand um what it means to be a man for me mm. okay so my thoughts have been like um on on very different stage because on 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 one hand we have this with this drama where we play a role of being a man on the other hand for for others this can be very serious you know so we have like this there's the playful game if we don't attach so much to to what it is if we are serious about it so we are really attached about what it does it mean to to be a man so the, the playfulness what i was um thinking about is like more okay we can jump into this role but actually the roles we are we are playing are as some kind of orientation on what people see outside to the scenery you know you have the public and they seeing the playfulness and that is very much linked to me to to the archetypes because the archetypes has been always like a kind of orientation for humankind if they are in legends or if you talk about this is masculine this is feminine uh whatever um they always have been like kind of a, a relation towards your own experience and the way you you find yourself in this experience might be very contrasting might be very you don't know exactly but maybe you know okay you're a man you know but sometimes not sometimes you feel like okay where where's my masculinity at being a man and you ask yourself what is my my feminine side you know and um most of the time um masculinity and femininity are like two poles of kind of complementarity this uh opposite the opposites that really can can make this attraction as we uh have been talking the last for two weeks ago and from from this perspective this way of setting something masculine or feminine that has been depicted in many mytholo mythologies but also in our cultures both by giving it to to the toilet and saying okay men have to go there and women have to go there you know mm. so this whole re realm of having a common sense of what it is you know is kind of what i could relate to the stage of life because people can relate to it 
and on the other hand, also ourselves. Even if we are looking to a stage, we can relate ourselves to the stage, you know, to what is happening to the narrative. And from what we have to experience in, in our in our lives right now as being like very modern, having all the feminist revolution of the 70s after. And this was the generation our parents grew up, you know. And so the, the role of the man that is given in our uh, society is very uncertain, I think, because it's changing so much, you know. Mm. 40 years ago, it was quite clear defined what a man should be. Right. Or mm. even 60 years ago. Mm. But I think it, it started from the industrial area when, when, when the man was dedicating his whole life working. You know? Mm. And then we didn't... Then now also women are working. You know, so we were kind of, uh, we don't have this polarity anymore that clear as we had this 40 years ago. Yeah, I'd just like to, to maybe jump in here and, and, and on this idea that we've lost a polarity um, because I think that from my readings, and from my understanding and from my, my experiences, the traditional worldview sees man and woman as different, but as harmonious. So the woman plays her role in her sphere and the man plays his role in his sphere, but they're harmonious in the sense that they're both complementary opposites. Um, and that the unity of the, unity of the world, um, kind of like yin and yang, is, is one. Um, and I think that my favorite definition of what feminism is as a, an epistemological strategy is, or a knowledge strategy, is a breaking of this unity. Um, it's, it's affirming, basically, it's breaking the traditional world. Um, and, it's, and, it, and, and from my, sort of, sort of from my um, understanding of, for example, the conservative movement and like, the reactionary conservative movement today, the common thread between all commentators, conservative commentators, is basically their defense of the traditional family and the traditional family unit. That's really what they care about. And, and from that point of view, um, feminism is a kind of break with that world. And like if you, if you like look back at the first um, big feminist philosophers from the Enlightenment, um, unfortunately, I forget, the, the, the name of the woman who I'm going to quote, but she basically said um, that marriage is the tomb of love. So that, that really captures the, the essence of the break, I feel, which is they're basically saying the traditional world is a fake and, and, and these traditional roles are, aren't going to work anymore. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a transformation of essence and it's, and it's saying that if there's complementary, if the traditional world believes in complementary opposites, um, the modern world believes more in an asymmetrical opposition, um, where the opposites are are in an antagonistic struggle with one another, um, as opposed to a symmetrical balancing. Um, but I just wanted to sort of um, jump off of of that, of off of what both of you said um, to maybe comment on this idea that archetypes, as you said, Daniel, are orientation tools. And, um, um, and to go on that also what, what Kevin said about the difference between man and woman and sexual reproduction. So it's true that in the biological world, we have males and females and males and females are basically determined by sexed gametes. And of course there's intersex. But that's pretty, that, that, that's, that's, it's, they exist, but, but, but most of the time you have sexed, sexed gametes in, in male or female. And then, and then what becomes man and what becomes woman 
are, are, are to me much more symbolic or cultural orientation tools. And if, as you say, Daniel, there's this fundamental break with modernity and industrial revolution where men, are, men were traditionally defined by their work output and women are now working too. So there's this asymmetrical push that we're all working and the women don't want to be defined by their reproduction. Um, then that could be at least one of the sources of the antagonism with the traditional archetypes. And if that's the case, um, and if my logic here is somewhat clear, my question that I would throw out is, um, do we need totally different archetypes? Um, and uh, if so, what would they look like? Would, would, they, would they still be, be man and woman? Um, or would they be would they be totally other? Um, and I guess it would depend on whether man and woman are archetypes which transcend mere sexual reproduction. In 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 that case, so I guess that's those are some of the thoughts I would like to to throw out to to both of you. Yeah, no, it's a brilliant framing of what what's happening here, and I want to I want to call in the metaphor of how I view an archetype. Very simple, the sun itself. So if the sun is an archetype, and this kind of plays into a little bit of like, you know, Plato's cave, then the many manifestations of the archetypes are the shadows cast by objects in some relationship to the sun. With the, this is the idea of the archetype being an ideal. So the ideal, the whole totality of what it means to be a man is this, is this, this star, this North Star or whatever, and then throughout history, we have different shades of its expression. And so to answer your question, Cadell, you know, do I think we need to reinvent new archetypes? No. I think we need to return to archaic models of man and woman that worked. We need to eliminate, you know, I, I think since the Enlightenment, this, this, this inquiry has really heated up. And so in the last maybe five or 600 years of Western civilization, there's a lot of elimination that I think needs to happen because of many of the taboos placed on sex itself and also many of the restrictions placed around marriage. And I tend to agree in the old model that marriage can be a tomb for love. And that, and that when I say that, I mean the love that is spontaneous, erotic, evocative of poetry, art, things like this, the very intense, passionate type of love. And I understand that, you know, there's, there's gradations here. It's a, it's a life cycle in a relationship. So that's not a, that's not a hard and fast, fast rule. Um, now, what, what we're seeing in the modern era, right? Like you're mentioning this, uh, this opposition we're seeing, I think is if you zoom out enough, there's a way in which you can see it as cause and effect. Because women weren't allowed to vote or hold jobs or hold pieces of office in the Western world, it's understandable on like a meta cause and effect level why as soon as that starts to happen, there's an eruption of energy, which we now see as the feminist revolution. And on the extreme side, I think it's quite violent and it's, it's more anti than it is for something. As you mentioned, it's anti the traditional sex roles. It's anti traditional marriage which the conservatives, rightly so, are very interested in defending because it's what they've mm -hmm. built their entire worldview on. So mm -hmm. there's, a, there's an aspect of that that I think is healthy because a challenging opposition from the suppression of the feminine in general has now erupted onto the world stage. And there aren't, there aren't modes I've seen, to my knowledge, that are able to contain it. The conversation is either... These women are crazy. They're taking on men's roles and or, you know, well, the, the reason they're not, you know, happy and, and satiated in their existence is because they're not conforming to the roles. And this is actually just a, they're acting something out that will return to normal eventually. And I think both of those are, are likely wrong. Um, and just to sum up here, I think the future of, of man and woman and these roles as they evolve in our culture, as we become exponentially 
more available in this conversation because of digital media. I think it's only going to speed up. It's not going to stop. You know, me too is evidence of that. Me too. I think is the, is the <laughs> proof of concept that's going to be surging us forward. Um, we don't need to invent new archetypes. I believe we need to delete and come to reckoning with a lot of the taboos that we've inherited and a lot of the restrictions and find a way to, in a healthy way, remove those, integrate them and release them and come into more totality of the expression of the archetypal man and woman. Good point, Karen. I, I'm thinking about what you said because um, one hand, I, I totally agree what you say. On the other hand, there is like the question, because I agree totally that the archetypes, we don't need any more archetypes. And then suddenly, um, I w I've been looking two episodes of the series, The American Gods. Did you saw them? It's about, you have like very old gods, actually the, the Viking gods, that are in America, you have like Caribbean gods that came through Africa to um, to America, and you have like digitalized gods, you know, and they're the new ones, and they're fighting each others. So there, I, I was just like, maybe we already have other archetypes, but we also have uh, the old ones that worked really good, but. The question having archetypes has been always to me about the totality, as you said. So where, where is the absolute? Where are the differences? If, if you look it into, uh, into, into mythology, for example, as the Greek mythology, then you always have the history of something creator, one creator, in Greek philosophy and uh, Greek mythology, it was like chaos or fan, fainus. Fainus was like kind of a light, what you said about uh, the, the Greek light, uh, the Platon's cave light would be something like that because it's actually light. Later in the, in the story of the family tree of the Greek goddess is coming Apollo as a god of the sun, you know? So there's a difference always about the sun and the, and the light itself because the uh, moon is also light, but the moon is always like the opposite of the sun. Sometimes it's female, sometimes it's male through the whole cultures, mostly. My mother was always like very surprised because she is Spanish speaking, native. So she was always surprised that the sun in German is male, you know, from its, uh, how you, how you uh, take the art article. And the moon is, no, other ways. The sun is female in German and the moon is male in German. So that was always very surprising for her. So when you have this whole history of, uh, of Greek mythology, it comes from one creator to, for example, Gaia and Uranus, which is like earth and father sky. And you have Floating, which is like a sea god, and then you have a lot of other um, sons and daughters, and they have like their issues, and it's in the end, it's always like a big history, and it's always a big mess, and wars, and envy, and traitors, and everything, you know, just as life we know it, but dramatically, we can say, you know, it's a drama because things get messed up. But um, w when you go to, to the beginnings of these mythologies, it's actually the totality you're talking about. It's like the light that is out there being the shadows. And the shadows are actually like our, our bad behaviors that we have, or our things that are in our shadows because we, we are not conscious about that. So... Uh, to me, mythology is always like related to, to our experiences and in the way it's actually a way back, you know, to, to the oneness, to the, in the end, like the egg, the cosmic egg where everything emerged. 
where everything is one. And in this course, the polarities of female and feminine is a complementarity one, which expresses it in different qualities. And, you know, it's like you have cold and you have warm and there are some degrees on that. So you have feminine and masculine and some degrees on that. And I was uh, thinking because with uh, some other persons, we thought about an uh, orthogonal complementarity, which is like you don't have a complementarity which is there's weak and there's strong, you know, because, for example, masculinity is from many qualities. It's like, okay, they have to be muscles, they have to be strength when there is a masculine energy, you know. If you look to, to a woman that has a lot of muscle, muscles, you wouldn't say, oh, that's a very feminine woman. No, a feminine woman, you relate to that like with curves, like soft, you know. So actually, if there is the quality of something strong, you don't put the direct opposite as something weak. You know, you, you can do this, but if you relate, because weak is something we, we, we think of, that's, that's not good, you know. Everything wants to be strong, even women want to be strong, strong woman. But I think the good opposition is when you have, for example, instead of something wrong, as strong, something flexible, you know. If you have flexibility as a quality, that might be so more on the feminine side, but actually very positive, you know, and not not weak, you know, because nobody wants to be weak, but flexible, yes, you know, if you're flexible, you, you can adapt yourself easily, you can change your mind, and you can adapt to, to anything. So I was thinking about how how this whole qualities really that can be played on the drama of mythology of nowadays experiences could really learn something about the, the myth that we had from the Greek but also we have from I mean nowadays narratives are our movies yeah and they're actually talking about mythology actually nowadays movies are full of the old ones full of the old mythologies, especially if you look into Marvel Studios, they're even the same names. And I think there is like a big global change, but there's still the old archetypes. But there are in another in another role they're, they're playing another they have like another another dress. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that does that does that mean that the the meaning of the play is itself changing? Because so like I would I would hear I guess I mean because both of you brought up Plato and Plato's cave metaphor and like with Plato and Plato's cave metaphor basically you have the idea that there is a single unified essence or a truth which exists independently of history. And um, in that context, I mean, that's often why Plato gets blamed for the, um, the late emergence of evolutionary theory, because in Platonic theology or Platonic metaphysics, you often don't think of changing forms, you think of stable, eternal forms, um, and you think of the changing forms as, in some sense, a lower-level reality. Um, but, of course, evolution sort of flips that all on its head. So, in the context of, of man and woman, and in relationship to what you guys were kind of saying about the 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 relationship between the ideal of man and woman as like a, a unity and the enacted man and woman as kind of like a, you know, um, an imperfect, an imperfect model that we try to embody in time. Um, 
could it be that the the orientation or the point of the play changes over time but the ideal remains the same and in if that's sort of the metaphysics that both of you are are trying to communicate um in that in that context could we say that well the human species emerged and we seem to be biologically sexed um and that there appeared half of the human species had a, a particular form of body and the other half of the human species had another form of body and one half of that species might have been more well suited to work and hard labor and the other half of the human species might have been more well well suited to obviously giving birth and having children and then if those two functions defined what became man and woman and those functions are now changing in the modern world which changes the play which changes the orientation um what becomes of the orientation um if we still have the same ideal in our minds that we want to be the best men and the best women we can be but the play or the drama is changing how should we interpret that change i'll i'll throw that that out yeah no i i love that idea of being sexed and there's a way in which the archetypes will move to their own ends. And this is what I mean by that. Deep, deep in like the Jungian sense of archetypes, right? There are these immortal meta-memes, let's call them, that have shaped the landscape of evolution. And I think they, it transcends, you know, humanity. I think that's pretty clear because we evolve out of, you know, proto-archetypic, forms and you could see the hominid as a type of this form that's a whole nother trialogue though probably to, to zoom in on man and woman though it's like i love what you're saying daniel the the drama and the landscape has changed a lot women are in the workplace women don't want to bear all the stresses of child labor and rearing the children i mean they, they physically have to bear the child but you know, the, the family structure and the emergence of co-parenting, um, the allowance in a lot of, I know in Europe, I, the States hasn't caught on, but of um, maternity and paternity leave. I think that's a, that's a, a very powerful policy emergence that's speaking to um, something beyond just the, the biological, that the man and woman archetype can coalesce in new configurations that may be that may appear alien to a traditional culture in which the female's only job in the hunter gatherer dyad was to gather food to produce children physically give birth and rear the children and that's pretty much it the men in that dyad were the hunters and undertook the difficult labor of war and bringing down game and also decision making in the, in the tribal politics, right? And that, that's, that's just a, one example. I think there's many um, structures to a society. However, that one seems to be the most dominant. Matriarchal and partnership societies seem to be the exception and not the rule. And I think it's- But, it's not, but, it, but it sounds like what you're describing is that we were two, but now we're going to like an androgynous form. Is that is that what you're you're saying? Yes, that's that, that's kind of what I was intimating. And you know, in the old so, days, you, you mentioned this, Daniel, where men were men, right? In the 1940s culture in the in America and Europe, there wasn't this this idea, right? It's like men are men. They're going to go to war. They're going to protect us. So they're going to go to the factory and work. You know, there wasn't an idea of like, oh. Now in, the, in modern era, you can be like, oh, that, that, that man is in his feminine essence. He's actually in a very vulnerable feeling state. He's very receptive. He's actually not, you know, and that, that's kind of what I'm speaking to, Cadell, where the, this, this androgyny, and I'm not speaking about physical androgyny. I'm, I'm, it's, it's hard to language, but it's like energetic androgyny. Well, if we're talking about the archetypes, we're talking about 
ideational and behavioral patterns which unconsciously structure human society. So right. it, in, in, in the context of what you were describing with government policy and w- with what you were descri- des- describing with sort of like the direction our families and the direction our social structures might be tending towards, it sounded like in the past, and this is like related to our topic, the historical emergence of archetypes, in the past, we had a, a, a kind of clear archetypal binary between man and woman, and that that historical binary was seen by the traditional culture as, as harmonious, that that's the natural order of things. But then I was arguing that with feminism, you have a breaking of that harmony, a rupturing. They're saying, no, it's not that harmonious totality is not the norm, normal state of the way things should be. And then what you were describing sounds much more like an androgynous androgynous horde where the masculine and the feminine archetypes are things that we that everyone has within them. Is that what you would say? Yes, yes, precisely. And I think, for example, the willingness of some men to participate in child rearing is evidence of this. Um, although they're in a male body and the male archetype, let's say, is the dominant structure to their behavior and their ideation, they're becoming aware, perhaps because of feminists and the radical conversations they've opened up in, in culture, that they are able to, let us say, allow the, the female archetype, so the behaviors and the ideas behind the female archetype, to move them. And this is where a man might be a stay-at-home dad or participate in child rearing, right? And I think this is what's reflected in policy with paternity leave. And I think that could be a good thing. I think that could be a good thing. Some people might say that's a bad thing. That man should be at work being a breadwinner, not participating in child rearing, maybe a little bit when he gets home from working a 12-hour day. And I think what we're, we're seeing now a telescopic effect in culture, to your point, Daniel, about the working man and the rise of industrial culture and what that did to the nuclear family. We're seeing now some of the effects of that because we're a few generations deep. And I would posit that it has not only not strengthened the nuclear family and the traditional family roles, but invited in a lot of chaos in the form of addiction, abuse, neglect on, on, the, on the extreme side. And on, the, and on the lukewarm side, you know, the man, if he's, if he's fully possessed by the male archetype, let's say, and the female's fully possessed by the, the female archetype, and they're, they're in a scarcity model, let's say, which has been the dominant model, I'd say, for most of history. Like, most of the world lives on less than a dollar a day, even today. Um, there, there's a way in which, you know, these archetypes were engineering survival, and rightly so. And now, for those of us in the digital mediated world, for those of us able to have these conversations outside of the traditional model where it's like, oh, wow, what, what, like, for example, for men, I think right now in 2018, it's very much in question. What does it mean to be a man? Men are feeling the heat. Global media is, is exposing a lot of male leaders and a lot of male behaviors that have not worked for the feminine. And so this, this is an interesting take here because Um, the archetypes being called into question, I would say. And so to your point, Daniel, do we invent new ones? Or do we find ways to more totally embody them? And as you're saying, Cadell, create a type of androgyny that doesn't speak to... Well, I'm not... I'm not... It speaks to the roles. Well, I'm not... I'm not... I'm not... um, I'm not... um, I'm not... For, I'm not for or against androgyny. I would say I'm. I would say I'm. 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 Um, I'm trying to figure out if that is the direction that you're you're describing society is tending towards, and and if if that is the way things are. T- if it if if it, if androgyny is the way society is tending towards, then I think there's a a lot of questions. Like for example, when you were at the Burning Man. Like if you're, if you're in Burning Man culture at the Burning Man Festival, would you say that culture is an androgynous culture? Because it's interesting to me the symbol of Burning Man because they're burning a man. Right. 
it's a, right. it's a, it's a very, it's very interesting. <laughs> There, there's two me- major takes I'll just quickly speak to because I was fascinated by this as well. One, it's like burning the man, right? Like I don't work for the man. It's like burning the system or like the patriarchy. Yeah. That's one take. The other take is the man and effigy is actually a, a symbolic destruction of the ego. And that, that, that's the one I tend to feel a little more. But to answer your question, Kadal, I'd say burning man may be the, I wouldn't call it an androgynous culture but it is a space and culture in which androgyny manifests more strongly than anywhere I've ever been. And what I mean by that is that females are fully in a full self-expression. If they want to be masculine and like really like physical and with their language and direct, they do that. And I think more common for me because of traditional roles and this, and this being like a radical break from that, I see many more men expressing the feminine. So dressing up in dresses, being very feminine with their speech, with their activities, and, mm. and there's everything in between. I think the, the weirdness factor, and what, what's actually coming to mind is like these non-binary uh, gender pronouns, which received so much heat when they were legislated, right? Like ziz yeah. and zir and they. I think that, that type of androgyny is not to my mind, highly beneficial to culture. I tend to side with the likes of Jordan Peterson on, you know, legislated speech and these pronouns, I don't find to be that useful. So that type of androgyny, I don't think is going to benefit culture on a high level. Um, and maybe androgyny is the wrong word. It's, I think it's a very charged word, but we're, we're, we're at the edge here developing the idea. So I'm, I'm curious. Your well, in, in, it, yeah, I'll go to we'll go to Daniel, but just um, from what I was reading in the symposium was that in the discussion they they frame an androgynous as kind of not like a multiplicity, but as but as a third sex. It's like a it's like your masculine and feminine, and and the masculine and feminine are are one within you or something. But it's like yeah, but it's like a third thing. Um, but yeah, Daniel, what what do you, what do you think about this? The direction of this conversation? Yeah. I, I like it actually very much because it's, it's actually what I was uh, also trying to say in some way with this uh, mythology. Because um, to, to, my, to my experience on one hand to everything that I figured out so far, it's really my, and also my philosophy, my, my way of doing science is how we can relate it to, to ourselves. How can we embody this, you know? Because if we do consciousness research, it's always about what you're conscious about. You can't make consciousness without your own consciousness. So you, you go into the subjectivity of all the things you, you can relate to. So when, when I'm talking also about, okay, we have like this mass of stories and dramas of Greek mythology, for example, and there is like kind of an evolution and it's like going to, to kind of oneness being, you know, then it actually also means to, to be androgynous. But in, in some way it is, we, we have like more, more masculine parts, we have more feminine parts. We have some things that are actually feminine but are in our shadows. So we, we experience some, some sufferings or some patterns of repetition or autonomous unconscious um, playfulness uh, on, on one side of a gender and maybe we discover this and then we integrate it and we, we found ourselves like being more complete with, with ourselves and in, in this way which is a process that is uh, actually really going on on the very global level right now because it's really about what happened in the 60s and 70s which took up from the uh, women's side to to regain like the masculinity actually because they uh, were taking up the roles the man played taking political decisions uh, going for for work, you know, taking all the things that actually man was doing, you know, even once like I was in a panel discussion and the 
people say, uh, okay, we have no, no woman at uh, the panel. So it's always like very patriarchal and hierarchical to speak from above to below. You know, it's like a very dominant masculine attitude and patriarchy and hierarchy. So the women jumped up on the podium and so they did the same as the man, you know, but it's actually not the same. So what is, there, there is kind of need, I think, from, from the masculine side, from the, from the man side, as you said, uh, to take up the, the feminine revolution, you know, because there was like the feminist movement for women, but actually there was no feminist movement for men. And mm. I think that is a good point to, to, to go on, to really stretch this concept of androgen being to, to, to another level, which I like very much because there is always kind of uh, feminine and masculine inside ourselves. But how is it expressed, you know, and for what is it good? I because come to, to to think of there is something if we take this example of uh, hierarchy I was thinking about what is really feminine what is really masculine and suddenly it came to my mind that there is almost no female rape on men you know there are some uh, some very small exceptionist stories about that but actually there's no percentage to 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 regain and imagine what the what does it mean there is almost no female raper that has a victim that is a male why a lot, of, a lot of a lot of that can be anatomical yes but a lot not all of it but a lot of it Sure, it has to be very anatomical on one hand, but if we take our embodied being, you know, when we look at the other side, it's, it's quite obvious that the most of the rapist uh, violence and sexual violence to men and women from men is during war. And it is actually to really subjugate the, the victims and the losers and to show the, the domination. You know? and, Can I? Yeah. Well, I finish your point, but I, I'd like to jump off in a sec. Yeah. So um, I think from the last 500 years, something about that, it has been really a bit not in balance to, to really have harmonious society on a global scale because actually we we really could need some more of the of the caring you know of the horizontal understanding of the collaboration stuff you know men tend to be more in, independent being the in the solitude and stuff like that and only, only looking from the very archetypal way, you know, that can reside in ourselves. Um, well, yeah. well, so it's it's very interesting. I mean, it seems like the 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 vibe I'm getting from both of you is is kind of like because this is a sort of this what we're trying to get at is the emergence of the archetypes and where I feel the conversations going is um, it's kind of like a enthusiastic prescription for a more androgynous culture or an enthusiastic prescription for a, a deconstruction of what masculinity is or what the, the, or what the traditional notions of man and woman are and, and an, an enthusiastic plunge into a more fluid kind of more balanced sexual environment, which kind of equals a more feminine environment or a more, 
a more feminized environment? Is that kind of the 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 energy? Uh, I think there's, I'm there's something here. There's something here about you know you hear people say the the future is female. I don't think we want to occupy a feminine reality. Like the masculine part of me, the warrior part of me that really appreciates competition and like direction and that sharpness would not appreciate that. However, to Daniel's point, because of war and the dominance culture that- But why is, but why, why are we only saying that war and the dominance culture is what man is? Right. It, it's That's not, more it's my, 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 or like, for, exa- or for example, when Daniel was saying that there was a feminist movement for women in the 60s, but there hasn't been a feminist movement for men. Why do men need a feminist movement? Well, I, I, because, like, because, because, to, men need to, a masculine to, movement. But that's more what, that's, but that, that's more what I would, that's more what I, that's more what I would say. That's more what I would say is it's not that, it's not that men need a feminist movement. I think it's good that women have a feminist movement, but I think what's lacking is men having a type of movement which helps them understand what it means to be a man. Because, and, and let, me just, let me just sort of say here sort of a, a, a psychoanalytic point about my views on, on gender and, their, and the emergence of gender. Because I'm essentially a Freudian. And, and, what I'm, and I can say specifically what I mean and why I'm a Freudian and why I'm actually not really a Jungian. But I'd start with a funny joke because Freud said, Freud said that the archetypal fantasy of the unconscious is basically burning of the primordial father. And, and that kind of emerges at Burning Man. It's kind, of like, it's kind of like the Freudian archetypal burning of the primordial father. Totally. Um, which is super interesting. And it's just like, what does that mean? And, and, I have, and I honestly don't have an, I don't really know what that means, but I think it's super interesting. But, but actually, Freud said something remarkable about gender. And, uh, and I think it's worth saying here, which is that, as we all know in biology, on the level of males and females, Males are actually a deviation. They're actually, it's, it's actually that males are actually kind of like a deformity. So as we all know, if you look at chromosomal patterns, the Y chromosome, which makes a male a male, is actually a crappy little chromosome. It's, it's the crappiest of the chromosomes. <laughs> it's all of the other chromosomes are nice and robust and long, and the male Y chromosome is a little crappy thing. And, it, and the default, like, like Kevin, you were saying about asexual reproduction, when, when organisms are in a mode of asexual reproduction, they're actually all default female, right? So, but now here's the twist, and here's, the, here's what I would call the Freudian twist, because Freud said about, about man and woman, about gender identity, he said it's the opposite of biology. He said we're default boys, and the deviation is girls. Mm. And why? Why is the default boys and the deviation girls? The reason he says, we all want the mother. No matter what, the subject starts wanting the mother. And the father is seen as an, the father is seen as an intrusion. The father is seen as the law coming in and, and, and taking our fun away, taking the breast away, ultimately. Right. right. So I, I almost see Burning Man as this, this motion. Like, <laughs> this, <laughs> here's the, the, man, the man is coming to take our breath away, you know? Right. But, so, it's sup- so it's super interesting. But if that's true, and so Freud had, like, Freud had a very complex view of how boys, how, how a human subject becomes a boy and how a human subject becomes a girl. And it's not tied to biology. It's not tied to biology. It has nothing to do with biology. Freud said that it has to do with how you identify your desire. So, for example, like I still remember when I was five and I realized that I couldn't marry my mother. And like what I said and what I thought in my mind was, well, that means I'm going to have to find another girl. It's like, well, (laughs) how am I going to do that? It's like, 
that's that's impossible. <laughs> I can't even talk. <laughs> right. But so that's funny. But then but it's interesting, like because he said it's actually more difficult for a human subject to become a girl. And the reason why he said that was because he said the girl has to identify themselves as the mother. The girl has to the girl has to say, well, I, it's not that I, I want the mother. It's that I'm going to become the mother. So it's a totally different process of identification. Um, but you see here the crucial dimension, and this is what I will absolutely stick to against both Plato and Jung, which is the asymmetry. It's not that you have a nice balanced opposite. It's not that you have a harmonious unity. The harmonious unity is always structured in an asymmetrical relation. And I think this is the core antagonism. This is why, this is why, for example, this would be my explanation for why we would say men need a feminist movement. It's because it's because there's we we know on an unconscious level that there's some asymmetry. And I think that there's some antagonism about this, there's some uncomfort about this. So I would just like to like so one I would say, and the question I'd like to throw out maybe to to get this conversation about the emergence of historical archetypes into some maybe clear focus um, for, for both of you is, is what, does it, what does it mean to want to be androgynous? And does it, does it relate to wanting to run away from the dark side of masculinity? And does it come from a not knowing how to be a good man? And if so, if so, what, what does a reinvented masculine archetype look like? Or, 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 is it, or is the androgynous direction the healthier direction? Because I'm, I'm honestly, I'm honestly, I have no idea. Yeah, there's, there's so much, there's so much here. There's so much here. And what I, what I mainly want to speak to is, I think the asymmetry is necessary on this plane of existence. In, in some theoretical realm of metaphysical forms and ideals, as Plato speaks of and as Jung talks right. about the collective unconscious, I think it, it could be possible to have a being where it's perfectly imbalanced. And this is something like, you know, mm -hmm. the Buddha or Bodhidharma or Christ. They, they, they are like the ideal, the messianic balance of masculine and feminine. However, on this plane, in this reality, in this culture and time period, what I am seeking personally, and this is how I work with my clients and I, I work in my, my thought process and articulation is like, I want to be integrated. So as a man, I want to be aware of the, the enema, which is the, the inner psychic nature of feeling and emotion, where actually great power and creativity comes from is what I've found is I can source from it. However, mm -hmm. never in my existence are they perfectly balanced, where I'm perfectly in a masculine male embodiment and mindset and a, a perfectly balanced feminine. There's always an asymmetrical dominant structure that is as very natural that I've, I've noticed. So if, mm -hmm. if, if something traumatic were to happen, for example, I might become asymmetrically dominant with my feminine side, my yin side coming to the surface where I can't control my emotion. And I think this is, this is speaking to the core of what is needed for masculinity right now. And it's being revealed and there's urgency now in the culture, which I think is healthy, um, hmm. is men and boys, well, mainly boys are not properly initiated into the totality of masculinity. So I don't think men need a feminist movement. Men need a masculine movement. And Esther Perel predicts this. She says, I, I forget which lecture or a series, but in the next 50 years, uh, a real men's movement will become dominant in the culture because it has to. Mm. What do you think about that, Daniel? Well, uh, I have to say that first, um, it's lead, it led to some confusion because as I said, that the feminist movement on what you can see, because it leads to two directions, because on one hand, Feminist movement became aware of themselves as with the female aspect. 
And on the other side, we had like the women got equally uh, to, to men. You know? So what I wanted to say in, on that page when I said, okay, it's like we had this feminist movement from a woman that visibly they took up um, roles that actually man had. So they, they embody actually man roles. You know, mm-hmm. but uh, what I wanted to say that it wasn't vice versa, you know, so yes. act, um, kind of the feminist movement was actually a masculine movement. Uh-huh. You know, that's but it's always been the, the feminist movement. Mm-hmm. And so do you think do you think wait, wait, the wait, wait, opposite wait, wait. can happen? Wait, wait, but because on, on the other side that what is archetypal, very feminine, is always like kind of the invisible one, the, the inside one, you know, the, the in, what is like not on public, you know, that's like, and so um, there was always like the very feminist also affirmation about this, you know, I've been uh, last Monday, I've been to, to a, concert about a hip hop a female hip hop really talking about this vulnerability black magic power the black ma- black woman magic and really talking about about love as a female power and the seduction you know so what is missing and what i tried to say it's like this movement of masculinity had to be one hand like a masculine movement, but also a feminist movement. And then we come to the androgynous, you know, because on one hand you have like the, the visibility and the invisible things, the things that are actually male, you know, when, when it comes to, to be a warrior, when it comes to be protective, when it comes to, to set up security, for example, you know, and you, you want to be strong and a man, and do you want to, really hold the family and yes maybe what mass do but on the other side it, it needs also like this uh, this movement that man can cry you know that man can express the feelings that man can no men no fear. men, men there i don't think men can cry have you ever cried what's 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 no, a that tear makes you, that makes you a pussy it, what that makes no, you no what Daniel? What's a tear? What's a what's a what's a teardrop? I've heard of teardrops. <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. So 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 I so again, so again so Daniel, what you what you're what you're saying is that the feminist movement was kind of like a masculine, more masculine movement, like, ba- and you equated that with hierarchy and dominance, like say, like, for example, uh, Angela Merkel or Hillary Clinton, like Angela Merkel or Hillary Clinton would be like women who are acting masculine, would you say? And like, what you're saying is that me- and you, you think that men need the opposite movement where we become more feminine. And so then it would be a more androgynous society. It can be, you know, it's, it's difficult to, to say it on a very individual level to yeah. a very cultural level, you know, and it's also kind of hard to say, okay, it's black and white, it's feminine and man, you know, because it's like the, the, the shades in between, I think it's, it's the most important because uh, in there we, we find the diversity and the differences still to, to go on and have the, the evolution of something new. And, but, but these shades, which are also problematic because we, we get lost because we don't have so much orientations. Could and that's be, what you said the archetypes were about. Yeah, yeah, you said yeah. The, you said yeah, the yeah. archetypes are about orientation. I come to that because what, what we had experienced from 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 these also 500 years of having science as it is now like all the archetypal thinking were has been displaced also in in the hidden in the shadows 
You know, you don't have astrology, you don't have mythology as something uh, public. So it is always like in, in a hidden culture with esoteric, which is, okay, that is not going to something public if high politicians are asking astrologists, you know, and they do almost everywhere. So I think that is, that is something as a flipping point where we might things might be think uh, there might be maybe there's a change going on in this i would I, i'm not i'm not sure if i would be more terrified of large-scale political astrology or 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 donald trump i'm not sure which one would be more terrifying i would put them in the similar camp but <laughs> donald trump has an astrology <laughs> Right. Donald Trump has an astrologer. I love that you pointed that out, Daniel. The feminine's been, <laughs> some of those sciences and arts have been pushed into the occult, and yet the mainstream still utilizes them, just not publicly. I think that's a, that's a great archetypal understanding of that. Um, okay. So <laughs> just, because, just because I think, I, I think we're at an hour, right. or we're approaching an hour, so, so in terms of like maybe to, to wrap up and maybe we'll each say like our, our thoughts, I, I start. I started by quoting Shakespeare and talking about the, you know, the world stage that we exist on a stage, and we didn't design the stage so that we appear on a stage, and and that we might say that's biology or we might say that's nature, and then, um, then we act on the stage and we dramatize on the stage, and and we call that maybe man and woman, and of course in history the man was seen as something specific and like you guys were, were saying and or as we all sort of agreed that it's related to sort of hierarchy and dominance and work and supporting your family. And for women, it was much more related to child rearing and, and that in the modern world and in the industrial world, that's sort of been broken. And we kind of took the conversation towards this really difficult place of, of talking about you know, and draw, do you know? Is our culture going to become more androgynous, or are we redefining man and woman? And, and and are those two binaries going to maintain themselves, but reinvent themselves with a different orientation? And I think for me, I'm. I think for me, I am still open. I'm still open because I see, you know, I I definitely see that you know, there's, there's downsides to being very masculine. There's, there's positives and negatives to being very masculine. I think that I've learned a lot and I've achieved a lot because of my masculinity. At the same time, I think I have run away from my body a little bit because of my masculinity on, in some ways. Um, so there's, it's a trade-off, I think. Um, and I can see the logic in, and the wisdom in, in androgyny, um, but I, I, I guess I'm still, I guess I'm still internally open to to more discussions about about what all this means, personally. So, so Ke Kevin, what what do you think? Yeah, I think you know it takes a lot of courage and a wide breadth and depth of knowledge to even approach this topic in a way. Yeah. So I want to, I want to celebrate us, myself, you two for doing it. I think in a very powerful way that isn't, you know, pulling too many punches. And I, and I think our audience, if they're really listening in, will feel that as well. So that's one. Um, for me, I, I, I think that for my role in all of this and my thoughts and my thinking, I'm thinking a, a very Jungian, Maybe, maybe, maybe too much so in some cases, where the archetypal understanding, the initiatory rites that you see present in ancient culture will be needed in the future. And a men's movement is already happening. It's already underway. But it's going to be as big as the feminist movement on the political and world stage. And I think we're in the early stages of that because it's being called for now. There wasn't a reason really to do this kind of work unless you were in crisis or behind the scenes. However, now for me, 
the end result may resemble something a little more androgynous. I think technology has something to do with this as well. I think technology is inherently feminizing in the archetypal sense because it provides rapid advances in communication and the speed of communication and global digital media is doing this. And I think wearable tech will feminize society more into something androgynous. And I don't know if we're going to have to do, we're going to have to do an episode on transhumanism and androgyny. Exactly. So we'll have to say, we'll have to save the transhuman element to this. Totally. Totally. That, that is where I was tiptoeing. And I know you love that. Kiddo. Um, I love it. Yeah. It, it's fascinating. <laughs> on, on the, on the masculinity level, I, I really am excited by this discussion. I'm excited to revivify some of the old gods that you spoke to Daniel in true expression of masculinity, true, total expression, total embodiment of masculinity, because being in touch with fe uh, more feminine contextual qualities, such as feeling emotion, such as shedding tears, such as communicating in a nonviolent way. I, wa I want to posit that this does not make you less of a man. There's a lot of homophobic programs in conservative cultures. It doesn't make you less of a man. You're actually becoming more of a man because a man contains those aspects too. And I still haven't gotten a good definition on a teardrop yet. <laughs> I haven't, I, I still haven't gotten a good. <laughs> I mean, for some men that they probably resonate with that. They probably resonate yeah. with that. I, yeah. For me, the final word is I want to play with a whole deck. I want to play with a whole deck of cards, not half the deck. That's this is men only. And not half the deck that this is what a woman is. I want to play with a whole deck. And I'm, un, I'm uncertain about what that will specifically look like in culture, but I'm dedicated to manifesting that in totality, whatever it looks like. Okay, I'm interested to see what, that, what, what, what becomes of that. Daniel. Thank you very much. So it's really about really thank you. To, to have these conversations because it's it's really a big deal we are we are talking about and it's really affecting so many people and so many people thought and acts and feelings actually because it's it's a very intimate topic as we we're doing it and by by having this intimate topic i think we were doing exactly this that putting the inside out you know and I think there's there's so much to say. There's so much to know about there, and I'm I'm really open also to 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 see how, how other people relate to 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 this this discussion because it's it's really where we're heading. Like it's really a frontier of of societal being of societal culture. We're we're talking here about, and so. Wow, you know. Yeah. I'll, 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 quick, I'll quickly say that in the uh, next, this, this coming week, and maybe I'll be able to talk about it in our next recording, but this coming week I'm going to a master class um, titled Sexuality and the Absolute. And so I'm, I'll, be, I'll be very, very interested to sort of hear what is discussed about there and maybe bring it into our conversation for, for our next episode. But, um, I love that. Bring us back yeah, to the report of that. Yeah, but um, yeah, I felt like we did, we did cover a lot and it's really complex, but I, I'm grateful to both of you for, for sharing your just raw opinion and and we're all sort of putting our identities out there in a very open way and i think it's i think it's great so i'm learning a lot and i and i'm happy for this yes yes yeah well viewers over on facebook we appreciate you being here see you in the comment section if you if you really vibrated and resonated with this topic either positively or negatively or neutral neutrally um, I invite you to share it or tag someone who would really benefit from joining this discussion. These are experiments and we are at the frontiers, as Daniel said. So this was trialogue number two. Look forward to trialogue number three. And we appreciate y'all so much. See you very soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> wow. All right. I'm going to stop the recording.